Now, the Three Martini Lunch with Greg Columbus and Jim Garrity. And welcome, everyone, to the Thursday edition of the Three Martini Lunch, along with Jim Garrity of National Review. I'm Greg Columbus of Radio America. Once again, all crazy martinis for conservatives today. It's quite a start we're off to here in 2019. (laughs) And we're brought to you once again today by Quip. Get your Quip toothbrush. It starts at just $25. And if you go to getquip.com slash martini right now, you can get your first refill pack of brushes for free. More on that in just a moment. Jim, let's go to crazy martini number one. I got to hand it to the voters of Minnesota's 5th Congressional District in an odd way. Um, we thought you couldn't get much crazier than Keith Ellison. Man, you've, you've done pretty well here in, uh, in, ah. ma- in matching craziness with Ilhan Omar. This is uh, uh, the, the female Somali, uh, first Somali member of Congress. Uh, made a lot of headlines because she's wearing her hijab in Congress. And now she's into conspiracy theories just a couple of weeks onto the job. So naturally, CNN has her on and treats her seriously. Uh, she sent out a tweet uh, about Senate Judiciary Committee Chairman Lindsey Graham saying they got him, he's compromised. And so CNN, with Jim Shudo and Poppy Harlow, asked her about this during an interview, and here is clip one. Can you explain that comment? So over the last three years, um, we have seen many times where uh, Senator uh, Lindsey Graham has told us how dangerous this president could be if he was given the opportunity to be in the White House. And all of a sudden, he's made um, not only a a 180 turnaround, but a 360 turnaround. And so I am pretty sure uh, that there is something happening. Second clip in just a second. 360 would be right back where he started, so he'd be a Trump critic. But uh, let's not worry about geometry. Everyone, please turn your geometry textbooks (laughs) to page 36. You will see that if you want to be facing the the opposite direction you started, you need 180 degrees. If you do a 360, you end up facing the exact same direction. (laughs) It's really awesome in a a slam in basketball. Not really what you think it is. Oh, man. So she goes on to say, well, maybe he's been compromised by donors in South Carolina or by polls showing that if he doesn't keep defending Trump, that he's going to have trouble running for re-election in 2020. So Jim Shudo and Poppy Harlow eventually push back. That's quite a charge to make. You say you're pretty sure based on based on what evidence, what, what facts. That's a remarkable uh, comment to make about a sitting U.S. senator. The, 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 ev- the evidence really is um, present to us. Uh, it's being presented to us in the way that he's behaving. But that's not evidence. That That's your opinion. But now as a sitting member of Congress, you would have tweeted they got him on this. A- again, just based on what evidence, Congresswoman? My, my tweet was just uh, uh, an opinion based on what I believe uh, to be visible to me, and I'm pretty sure uh, there are lots of Americans who, who agree on this. Wow, that's a pretty impressive backpedaling there, Jim. And uh, I guess kudos to CNN for actually asking a Democrat some tough questions. Oh, oh definitely. Absolutely. Uh, yeah, so besides the uh, quick refresher she needs in geometry... Thought one is, if you actually watch Lindsey Graham over the years, as most of us have, this isn't as stunning and shocking as you might think. Well, the biggest change is that Donald Trump became president of the United States. And then all of a sudden, Lindsey Graham had a really big interest in figuring out how do I influence the president of the United States? And he and a whole bunch of other Republicans up on Capitol Hill started figuring out how do I gently nudge the president in the way that I want? How do I get on his good side? And of course, Trump starts, you know, uh, Lindsey Graham starts praising him. This isn't that shocking. Um, you could, if, if, uh, if the congresswoman's least favorite uh, Democrat in the, the upcoming 2020 primary ends up getting elected, the congresswoman's going to start saying a lot nicer things about that stuff. So this isn't, you know, a grand conspiracy. This isn't an utterly inexplicable chain turn of events. Um, Rand Paul made a lot of nasty things, said a lot of rotten, you know, criticized Trump during the 2016 primary. Now that Trump is sounding more isolationist, Rand Paul is singing his praises. This is what lawmakers do. When somebody comes around to your point of view, you, you start praising them. And whether you think it's a good idea or a bad idea, uh, this is just kind of the way the game is played. This isn't some bizarre mystery or something like that. But here's the really, really kind of sticks in my craw. Um, 
you know, look, if you're Lindsey Graham's age and you're not married, sure, you're going to get rumors. Ah, I think, you know, who, who, is he seeing somebody on the side? What's he doing behind closed doors? Uh, we can argue whether that's fair or not. I don't think that's fair. But here's the thing. It's going to happen. And, you know, if in South Carolina politics, those claims and rumors have been around for a long time. It's different when it comes from a member of Congress. We expect better. We expect more. And like you said, good for, for CNN for pushing back on this. She, you know, should have, when she says, you know, the evidence is in his behavior, they say, well, no, that's not evidence. You, you know, hopefully the congresswoman is capable of some embarrassment there. And then when she says, it was my opinion, so you don't have evidence is what you're saying there. Well, like, <laughs> you know, this is a circumstance that really was worthwhile uh, for the CNN anchors to really push her on this because um, once we get into that, you know, look, if you hate what Donald Trump is doing to our in course, people are saying, people are telling me, et cetera, et cetera. You don't beat Trump by becoming him. And this is just another example of how the coarsening of the culture, um, and there's now no sense of accountability. Maybe maybe it's time for the Congress to censure her uh, over this. Like, we, we just censured uh, King over his outrageous comments. This kind of claim. Uh, they, but then here's the third thing. Would the Congresswoman say, like, is there something wrong with Lindsey Graham if, that, if he happens to be that way? That certainly sounds like homophobia. That certainly sounds like demonizing someone for what they do in the bedroom, which I was told Democrats were you know, adamantly opposed to, Greg. I guess it's okay if you're you know, doing that to a Republican. Somewhere in St. Paul in the attorney general's office, Keith Ellison is saying, man, she's really out there. <laughs> <laughs> there are many not tasteful things I could say in response to that. that one. Well, speaking of tasteful, let's get a good taste in your mouth. The new year begins, and it means new resolutions. We're more than a couple weeks in now, so I'm guessing about 80 to 90% of those resolutions have already hit the bricks. But uh, let's think of one you can actually stick with, and hopefully we're already working on it, and that's brushing twice a day. Hopefully it's a pattern we've had for many years. So let's talk about oral health and with a quick electric toothbrush, sticking to good brushing habits is simple. The guiding features are like a built-in support system for better brushing. There are a whole bunch of reasons why you should use Quip. They have sensitive sonic vibrations for an effective clean that's gentle on your sensitive gums. A lot of people brush too hard, and some electric toothbrushes are just too abrasive, much like certain members of Congress. (laughs) Built-in two-minute timer pulses will go off every 30 seconds to remind you when to switch sides and when to help you to clean your whole mouth evenly. Up to 90% of us don't brush for a full two minutes or we don't clean evenly. The multi-use cover works as a stand, it mounts to mirrors, and it slides over your bristles to pack and protect your Quip on the go. Plus, there are no wires or no clunky charger, and it runs for three months on just a single charge. The brush heads are automatically delivered on a dentist-recommended schedule of every three months for just $5.00. A friendly reminder when it's time for a refresh and to stay committed to your oral health. Apparently up to three quarters of us use old, worn-out bristles that are just not effective. Quip is one of the first electric toothbrushes accepted by the American Dental Association, and they're backed by over 25,000 dental professionals. They have thousands of verified five-star reviews. And Greg, we've had many fine products uh, sponsored and, and choose to sponsor this podcast. There are not a lot where I can say I use the product every single day. The Quip toothbrush is one, and no, despite uh, rumors you may have heard, I do not use my Hopsy beer uh, machine every single day. That's probably good. That Many of the reasons Jim just laid out there are the reasons that so many people love Quip. Uh, I mentioned my wife um, pretty much commandeered mine, and she loves it, and that's why over one million happy, healthy mouths really love Quip as well. Quip starts at just $25, and if you go to getquip.com slash martini right now, you can get your first refill pack for free. That's your first refill pack free at getquip.com slash martini, G-E-T-Q-U-I-P dot com slash martini. Well, if you thought our first crazy martini was fun, buckle up for our second one. Fox News, although the Wall Street Journal is really the one that broke the story. Michael Cohen, the president's former fixer who was recently sentenced to three years in prison, leveled a new allegation Thursday at President Trump by claiming his former boss directed him to rig online polls, online polls ahead of the 2016 presidential race. Cohen tweeted the allegation after the Wall Street Journal published a story saying that he paid thousands of dollars to a man named John Gauger of the company Redfinch to try to boost Trump's standing in two polls. One was a 2014 CNBC online poll of the country's top business leaders. The other was a 2015 online Drudge Report poll of potential Republican presidential candidates. 
Despite the reported efforts in 2014 and 2015, Trump did not do well in either poll, according to the Wall Street Journal. Trump did not make it into the top 100 candidates of top business leaders, and Trump ranked in fifth place, or 5% of the Drudge Report poll. Online polls, unlike scientific ones conducted by pollsters, are notoriously unreliable. The paper said Cohen agreed to pay Gogger $50,000 for his services, but ended up only paying the vendor uh, no more than $13,000. Still, the journal reported that Cohen asked for and received a $50,000 reimbursement from Trump over the work. Trump's attorney, Rudy Giuliani, used the revelation to portray Cohen as a thief. Quote, if one thing has been established, it's that Michael Cohen is completely untrustworthy, Giuliani told the journal. Here's my favorite part. According to the report, Cohen also paid Gogger to create an at Women for Cohen Twitter account to promote himself. That account, created in 2016, is still active today and describes itself as an account for, quote, women who love and support Michael Cohen, describing Cohen as strong, pit bull, sex symbol, no-nonsense, business-oriented, and ready to make a difference. So, uh, Jim, once again, uh, this looks like the Keystone Cops here. A lot of sinister moves that don't actually pay off in any conceivable way here. What do you make of it? You know, I think it was uh, Pope Hat on Twitter earlier this morning who says, this is yet another reminder that Hillary Clinton did not lose to the varsity team in 2016. <laughs> and or somewhere on the Hillary campaign, there's anything. We lost to these guys? You know, 13,000 to, um, to to rig polls, uh, online polls, because, you know, we know how effective they are. And they didn't do it. Like, that's that's the other thing. It's, you know, you're like, ah, oh, well, you know, you know, if he'd had the old Ron Paul numbers you used to see, in the Drudge poll after every debate in 28, 2008, 2012. You're like, oh, okay, you know, boy, you know, I, I don't know about you. I can set up fake Twitter accounts for you for like half the price. <laughs> Uh, for really, you know, just just you, you, everybody knows where my email is. Six thousand five hundred bucks. I will set up a fake Twitter account talking about how manly and sexy you are. Um, <laughs> like this, this may very well be one of the saddest things I've ever um, heard. Because you know, Greg, I don't know about your experience on Twitter. I have found that there are Russian women who are genuinely <laughs> interested in me on a regular basis. Um, the, <laughs> the other thing is, so here's the question: Is Let's assume this information came to the Wall Street Journal by someone who doesn't like Cohen and wants to make him look stupid because there's there's a need for more of that, apparently. <laughs> um, Greg, does this come from the Trump team because Cohen has apparently flipped and is now a witness for those who don't like it? Or does this come from people who are like, no, no, this is Michael Cohen. Uh, Michael Cohen was Trump's lawyer for more than a decade. Who the hell hires a kook like this? So kind of a fascinating uh, question there. If you thought your opinion of Michael Cohen couldn't get any lower, oh, <laughs> we're we're just getting started. We're we're, we're this is the deep water horizon of, uh, of drilling down into psychosis. Apparently, Trump's the only one who thought this guy was competent, which is entertaining in its own way. In, in certain ways, uh, the other thing here is I just keep going back to almost an Allen Iverson mindset here of online polls. We're not talking about real polls. We're talking about online polls. You know, his old practice rant. Yeah. Why would I go to practice? All this cloak and dagger. I think there was a boxing glove from a mixed martial artist involved here, too. Paper bags of cash to try and goose an online poll two years before a presidential race that was about business leaders. What is with these people? You know, <laughs> look, it's, it's a lesson of real estate. Uh, <laughs> what is your house worth? What someone's willing to pay for it? What is that business leader poll result worth? What someone's willing to pay for it, and apparently that's a couple thousand dollars. All right. Anyway, let's move on to our third crazy martini. This was not quite a, as much of a guffaw, but uh, it's crazy nonetheless because uh, Crazy Uncle Joe is probably going to run for president, and he's probably going to be one of the early front runners. That would be Joe Biden, eight years vice president for Barack Obama, and before that, 36 years in the United States Senate. Jim, you've done another excellent dive into the Biden record. This one going back more than 50 years now because Biden's got such a longer track record than most of these other people jumping into the race. And so what are a couple of the quick highlights? 
Sure. I mean, the first thought I, I noticed that, you know, compared to, say, Kamala Harris or someone like that, you know, Joe Biden was just vice president for eight years, was in the Senate for a really long time, pretty darn high profile. So a lot of people are like, oh, I, I know Joe Biden. I, I know who he is. If, you know, at the risk of sounding self-promoting, check this out. There's a lot of stuff in here that you've probably forgotten. And I skipped over the plagiarism of Kinnock and you can't go into a 7-Eleven without being Indian American accent. Uh, BFD, like I, I skipped over all of the classic Biden gaffes and moments that most people uh, probably instantly remember and things like that. I really started to look back to, and, and there are a couple of broad categories here. The first is, look, let's face it, um, whether or not Joe Biden is a centrist, and I, I don't really think that term, uh, at least as I define it, can really be fairly applied to him. It is worth noting that he's been a Democrat who's been around for a very long time, including times when the country was a much more conservative place than the Democratic Party is today and certainly than progressive activists were today. Joe Biden was an opponent of forced busing both in Delaware and he effectively killed it in the U.S. Senate. Now, a lot of people, you know, are going to say, ah, you know, that, first of all, it was a long time ago and that's fine. Uh, they probably agree with them. I don't know how much how well that plays with uh, with with the Democratic progressive primary voters of today. Uh, and it's kind of fascinating that this didn't really come up in either one of Biden's previous presidential campaigns. I think that could be a much tougher one. Um, I think it's a very good thing that he managed to look beyond his partisan divisions and his past vehement op- you know opposition uh, vehement opposition to the late Strom Thurmond. And there's a hilarious story in there Biden says yes. about break, you know, nearly breaking up a fight between Strom Thurmond and some angry tourist in the Capitol. But, you know, Joe Biden said Strom Thurmond was a good man at his eulogy. <laughs> it's the sort of thing that attack ads are made of. Um, everything he did with the crime bill. Joe Biden used to brag about how much he expanded the death penalty. Big chunk of the Democratic Party today is not cool with the death penalty, not cool with civil asset forfeiture, not cool with uh, much heavier sentences. Five years possession for crack cocaine. I mean, Joe Biden was determined to out tough on crime the Republicans back in the 80s and and good chunk of the 90s. And that's not the sort of thing that's going to play very well in today's primary. Um, The other thing is also kind of interesting and it's something to kind of keep an eye on. He there's there's a strong argument to be made. He and Hillary Clinton did not actually get along very much at all. Correction. I'm sure personally they get along, but there was a rivalry. They both were seen as the successors to the throne. And Biden, you know, the blunt speaking guy that he is. Uh, has offered some pretty tough critiques of her 2016 campaign. I am sure this has not been forgotten by Clinton world. And I am sure uh, that there are probably some of the old Clinton croaks, folks will be very eager to shoot back uh, if and when the primary gets rocking and rolling. Um, I mean, he's been around a really long time. And because of that, uh, oh, the other interesting thing, I mean, look, he says that he believes life begins at conception. Uh, he voted twice against partial birth abortion. I think we can safely say, looking at the Obama administration's record on abortion, if he does have any moral qualms with abortion, they did not end up influencing policy in the Obama administration at any point. But I could see, you know, your average liberal, you know, 20 something uh, Democratic activist, progressive Democratic primary voter hearing that and saying, whoa, 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 I don't want to hear any of that. So um, he's very much an old school Democrat. And that probably presents some unique strengths for the general election. But I think that also presents some really unique problems in a Democratic primary with this, you know, particularly if the likes of Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez are the, uh, uh, are the you know, voice of the future or, or the direction the Democratic Party is heading in. Uh, Joe Biden could end up having a much tougher time uh, in this Democratic primary than anybody's thinking right now. Jim, excellent work by you again. And a, and a couple of things stood out there. First of all, I think just the fact that he was Obama's vice president is probably going to inoculate him against some of, of the uh, criticisms. But in, in, in the wide open field, you just never know what momentum is going to develop. The other thing I think that, that, that works in Joe Biden's favor is that on a personal level, he's a, he's a really endearing guy. Not only just the horrific tragedies he's been through, but he's he's someone who seems pretty normal if you get him away from politics. I mean, if he was your your neighbor across the street, I'm sure he'd let you borrow the mower or the hedge clippers. And if you didn't talk about politics too much, uh, he would seem like a pretty normal guy. Uh, but then you'd talk about how he actually thought fairly well, or at least didn't think Judge Bork uh, was uh, that much of a radical. Biden was the chairman of the Judiciary Committee at the time, which makes you wonder why he never said a word when Ted Kennedy out and out slandered 
uh, Judge Bork. Joe Biden also oversaw uh, the Clarence Thomas uh, hearings debacle. And uh, I think he made a spectacle, I believe, at the Sam Alito confirmation uh, hearings when he put on a Princeton hat and uh, went 27 minutes before even asking a question because he was such a grandstander. So this is a guy who, when you get him away from politics, I think he would seem like a pretty regular, approachable, friendly guy that you could get along with. But uh, when the partisan hackery opportunities are out there, Joe Biden is uh, elbowing people out of the way to get in the front of the line. And so uh, conservatives yeah. beware. I was going to say the inherent Joe Bidenness of Joe Biden, <laughs> I think is very much kind of like this is one of the great X factors uh, for a Democratic pr- Party primary in 2020, because this is a different party than it was for, you know, for I guess we're now up on six years ago. This is a very different party than it was in 2008. And um, so the, the, the upside would be, as you were describing there, Greg, like I, the whole time I'm doing the research for this, I'm reading his old autobiography, I'm reading books written about him, these old profiles, old interviews. And a lot of the time I'm just laughing or giggling hysterically because he really does come across as your crazy uncle. Um, and, and, you know, just the, the sheer faces he makes at the State of the Union. I am sure that half of our listeners are laughing or giggling to themselves because they can already picture, picture the ridiculous expressions he would make during all these things. On the flip side, we are a culture that has gotten way more touchy about what kind of language you use, what kind of words you use, uh, whether things can be construed as being insensitive or, or something like that. And Greg, this is a guy who ran around talking about predatory lenders and called them Shylocks. Uh, the anti-defamation league was like, ah, uh, no, pl- please, you know, that, no, we, we know you're good to us. We know you're not a raging anti-Semite, but that's a really bad one. And the great irony, Greg, I was mentioning this to my wife yesterday and she just started giggling uncontrollably. Like three days later, he talks about the leader of Singapore being the wisest man in the Orient. I mean, he just steps on rakes all the time and there's nothing that can stop it. And it was always kind of endearing as, ah, you know, there's our goofy vice president when he's the candidate. And with this much touchier, much more, you know, uh, less forgiving, much more eager to lash out social media environment. I don't know if Joe Biden uh, thrives the way he did, uh, you know, 5, 10, 15 years ago. Yeah, that's interesting. I mean, when he was growing up, Orient was a perfectly acceptable term, I I would imagine. Uh, The other thing is, you know, uh, he he got handsy at times. I don't think in a a creepy way, but he certainly... uh, no, it was put, just weird. It know? was just very weird. And the picture that I always think of is when he's got his hands uh, on the, the the biker lady, and and then the look on the on the yes. biker guy's face in that picture is classic. Yeah, I mean, again, there are certain things that you could say, ah, he can get away with it because he's you know he's cultivated this reputation as America's national you know uh, crazy uncle. But I don't know if we're in that same culture anymore. And so it'd be interesting to see whether. Um, at some point, this you know, comes across it again. He, he is a very old fashioned personality, and if you're the Trump campaign, this probably should concern you a little bit in that he is uh, certainly the kind of lively personality and you know feisty debater malarkey uh, <laughs> that could you know go toe to toe with Trump. I just don't know if that's the the type of brand that the Democratic Party is still buying these days. Interesting. Very interesting. In a crowded field, we certainly learned a couple of years ago that it can easily turn out the way you least expect. So, Jim, we'll be watching. Great job again. I encourage folks to read the 20 things you may not have known about Joe Biden at National Review Online. And uh, we'll do this again tomorrow. Talk to you then, Jim. See you tomorrow, Greg. Jim Garrity of National Review. I'm Greg Corumbus of Radio America. Thanks for being with us today. Don't forget to check out getquip.com slash martini. Get your toothbrush, first of all, starting at just $25. And if you go to that website, getquip.com slash martini, you'll also get your first refill pack of brushes for free. And tune in again Friday for the next Three Martini Lunch.